Welcome to the Jury Thinks What podcast. Part of the Lawyer Minds ecosystem, the Jury Thinks What podcast discusses everything there is to know about trying cases, from preparing the case before the lawsuit is filed all the way to trial, and most importantly, how to understand what the jury is thinking. During our journey, we'll be talking to some of the brightest trial lawyers from many walks of life. What makes them successful? What makes them different? Do they have secrets to dealing with the jury? Let's find out. Here's your host of the Jury Thinks What podcast, Saul Gruber. Thank you for uh, tuning in to the Jury Thinks What. This is a uh, podcast by trial lawyers for trial lawyers on the Lawyer Minds Network. Uh, the purpose of this podcast is to bring trial lawyers who are trying cases every day of the week all over the country on to discuss their thought process, why they do things, and also talk about trials they've had, both good and bad, and to help everybody simply do better. Uh, this podcast really is for not only just the advanced trial lawyer, but someone who's never tried any cases in their life. One of the reasons we started this podcast was we noticed there are many newer lawyers that are simply hanging their shingle and maybe don't have a mentor. And hope that this uh, podcast does for you what our mentors did for us when we were younger lawyers. Today will be part two of the podcast and interview with Brendan Lupitan, outstanding trial lawyer out of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and self-professed trial geek. Uh, Brendan is uh, really impressive in the way he goes about thinking of things and uh, doing things, uh, whether it be uh, the way he asks questions or framing the case. Uh, this part, will uh, he will be discussing his recent $10.8 million verdict in the pandemic era that he obtained in Pennsylvania for a medical malpractice case. Brendan will take us through the story of the case and how the pandemic did or didn't affect his connecting with the jury and uh, the verdict he got. So uh, let's, uh, without wasting any more time, get right back to our interview with Brendan Lupitan. In regards to the trial, MedMal, rural county, and uh, it was, I mean, it was really strong facts in the case. So the gist of the case is community hospital, as, as the defense portrayed it, little community hospital in the mountains. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but it was a small hospital. And a year before this event happened, they uh, bought and installed a new MRI scanner. So before that, they'd had a CT and an X-ray, uh, but they had to contract out their MRI to this other company. It would pull up in a van outside and people would go out there. So they, they buy the new uh, MRI. And what they do is they essentially adopt a good policy that applied to the CT scanner for the MRI, which is in any room where there's going to be diagnostic agents injected in patients. So, you know, in CTs, it's iodine type uh, contrast agents sure. and in MRIs, it's something called gadolinium. So either of those are known in, in, in small percentage of cases to cause really bad allergic reactions that can result in anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis, if untreated, you know, can, can lead to shock and death, all right? So they have a policy that says in any room where patients are gonna get injected with contrast medium, you have to have a drug box with the drugs to treat the allergic reactions. Good policy. So then when they installed the MRI, there was one other policy. And this is all relevant because it's what we framed our case around. Sure. The other policy was they, they built a room attached to the hospital that the MRI is housed in. Immediately adjacent to it is the technician's room where they're you know, sort of operating things while the patient's in the MRI scanner. They put a, a bell, not a bell, but an alarm. So a button on the wall. And if the tech needs it, they hit it and an alarm goes off in the emergency room. And the policy was that when the alarm goes off, emergency room doctor and, and one other staff member, probably a nurse, supposed to immediately respond and help the technician with the patient in the MRI. They're particularly important because the other policy was MRI technicians are not allowed to treat patients when things go south. They're allowed to give them the gadolinium injection, but they can't treat them, all right? So those are the two policies, drug box policy, alarm bell policy. 
So our client's 41. He's a uh, project manager for a, a, a telecommunications company. Uh, he's got three daughters, um, you know, good guy, kind of the, he's the older of four kids in his family. Everybody depended on him. He was kind of the keystone of the family and everybody sort of talked about. Chronically bad back that he'd been dealing with for a decade. Uh, his doctor was prescribing him a lot of oxycodone. Um, and uh, he goes back to his uh, doctor and says, you know, this still isn't helping. Doctor says, I want you to go get an MRI. Sends him over to this hospital to get his MRI, both with and without contrast. So he goes in, they put him in the scanner, they do the non-contrast MRI, no problem, okay? So technician testifies that she goes in, she pulls him out of the scanner, she you know, puts the butterfly needle in the arm, begins injecting the gadolinium. And like that, he starts to react. She doesn't even, she doesn't even inject all the stuff into him wow. because of how quickly he responds. His face turns red, he starts struggling to get up, I wanna sit up, I wanna stand up. And she immediately realizes something's wrong, okay? One other interesting fact. So, a year before this, that same MRI technician starts working there and she was really seasoned. She'd been an MRI technician for like 25 years before this, worked at other facilities, et cetera. She testifies that when I started doing the MRIs at this hospital, I realized that there was no drug box in the MRI. And I actually went and asked the manager of the radiology department, hey, why isn't there a drug box in there? And I was told, uh, you don't, we don't need it in there because the emergency room is just down the hall. Okay, it's, it's close enough. And, and to be fair, the emergency room was like 60 feet away from the MRI. But nevertheless, no drug box in there. And it stayed that way. So now flash forward to patients reacting, technician realizes, oh no, this is one of those reactions. She goes into the, into the room as she's supposed to, hits the alarm, nothing happens. Nobody comes. So she then runs out into the hallway of the uh, hospital and screams, I need, I need help, I need help, get a doctor. So the uh, head of radiology is reading films at the time, he hears this, he walks down the hall through the three doors in the MRI, and he testifies, he looks and sees the patient laying on the scanner and says he's unconscious when I get in there, okay? Probably not a good thing. So what does he do? He leaves, and he leaves the technician who can't treat the patient, and he walks out because there's no emergency room personnel that's arrived at this point, so he's going to go find them. Got it. So, so he walks, and, and this is where, you know, uh, reality is, is, you know, stranger than fiction sometimes. And he makes his way to the emergency department where he knows the, the emergency room doctor hangs out if they're not treating patients. And he gets in there and he actually finds the doctor that he's looking for, except instead of sitting at his computer terminal, you know, doing notes, the guy is standing on a chair. This is the emergency room doctor. He's standing on a chair with his head inside the drop ceiling. So he's standing on a chair, he's pushed up a drop ceiling and he's, and he's in there with his head up inside of it. Radiologist's like, what are you doing? He's like, this, there's this sound that's been going off. I'm trying to figure out like where it's, where it's coming from. Oh my God. Radiologist's like, well, never mind that. There's a patient in the MRI, we need help. You know, we need help, okay? He's like, all right, fine. So he stops what he's doing, gets down. They walk down, get in there, patient's unconscious. Emergency room doctor realizes this is not a good situation. And then they finally, who knows how long this took, get the guy onto a gurney, take him down to the emergency room bay where they do have all the medicine and everything to take care of him. And uh, they claim only at that point does he arrest, uh, goes into cardiac arrest from his hypotension caused by his anaphylactic shock. And um, they do resuscitate him after like 20 something minutes, but because of the lack of blood circulation, he suffers a significant anoxic brain injury. Uh, so that's the case in a, in a dramatic nutshell. That was a dramatic nutshell. I, and I love the way you told the story because you left, you let me make my conclusions of what that weird sound was. Uh, 
that his head was. was. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, you know, uh, but I think that's important for, you know, one of the things we do with this podcast is it's, it's, it's for lawyers who have our experience, but it's also for new lawyers. And that was an excellent way of telling a story without telling me what happened. You told me what happened, but you let me reach my own conclusions. And finally, to the point where I said, oh, my God, because uh, he's looking. I mean, the alarm is ringing and his head is up in the uh, trying to figure out what it is. Yeah, I, I think it's I think that's such a critical. You, know, you talk about there's a lot of different ways you could do an opening statement. Right. Okay? Um, but the, in my estimation, there are certain heuristics, things that you should always utilize and implement in your opening statement, whatever way you choose to do it. I personally still am very fond of, um, you know, a version of the David Ball Keenan opening. Okay. So I really like to get right to a rule that everybody agrees with. Okay. You know, again, and that was, you know, taken from Malone and Friedman and then sure. Reptile and those guys turned it into their version of stuff. I love that general concept. And then, you know, the, and then I pose it as a question. Okay. I say, you know, so ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be up for you to decide during this case, if a hospital does not follow its own policies and procedures, and as a result, a patient gets seriously injured, who should be responsible for all the harm that's caused? Okay. That's going to be for you to decide. Now, let me tell you the story about what happened. Then story is focus of judgment, focusing effect or framing like Mandel says, all on the key actions of the defendant. And you don't tell some chronology, you have to pick the critical points where you want the attention focused on. And to your point, to bring this full circle, your story, you want to allow the jurors to remember the rule that you talked about and then see for themselves and come to their own conclusion how it was violated and say, aha, oh, I see what's going on here. So that's fascinating. So you actually take the rule, pose it as a question, then get into what the defendant did. Well, I've done that before. What I, what I, it's a slight tweak. So give the rule. So the rule in this case was something in effect of doctors and hospitals must follow their own, and I stressed own, policies and procedures uh, you know, to protect patients from serious injury, okay? And then I say, now, the question for all of you, ladies and gentlemen, to consider during the course of this trial is, if a doctor or a hospital violates that rule, the safety rule, and as a result, a patient is seriously injured, who is responsible for paying for the harm? Now, let me tell you the story about what happened. I love that. that yeah, I, I like that too. I think the other, because the, the original was, it's more like, you know, it, it was more like telling the jury Right. what they had to do. And I right. like that. So you post- take the second rule of causation or responsibility and, and make, and already in the opening statement or telling the jury you are in charge, it's up to you as to who's responsible. I yeah, love that idea. A- absolutely. Empowering yeah. them from the first two minutes. Yeah. And, and, and not, you know, not beating them over the head. You do get to that in your opening. You explain why you're suing, you know, but the jury's already kind of gotten it. Like, okay, right. I know why you're suing, you know, and then you're going to explain, and then the critical part there, and I heard this on one of the trial school opening statements recently, and I, it really clicked me, with me is, you have to clearly demonstrate to the jury in your opening how if things had gone the way you say they should have, that it would have done this good outcome, but because they did it this way, it led to that. You have to clearly show the difference between the you know, care, or the actions that you're saying should have been done versus the ones that did occur and led to this bad outcome. That's I think that's a brilliant, a, a brilliant statement, what you just said. I think too often we're, we're not focused on that. We're just focused on, look, this is what they did. They did mm-hmm. it wrong, and this is what happened. Uh, where I used to get beat up in depositions and trials where when the closing argument of the defendant was said, well, you know, if it's a bed alarm, well, why would, how would the bed alarm made a difference in a nursing home fall case? And if I haven't told the jury that, I begin to shrink in my chair because now I I see the way I'm going to lose. I love that. That's brilliant. Well, and and you know, we were talking about this before we started about in most, I think, I don't do a lot of nursing home, uh, but they have some similarities to medical malpractice. Most of the time when you lose 
uh, you know, unless it was just a terrible case. But most of the time when you lose a medical malpractice case, you lose it on causation. Right. Okay. And I think that has so much to do with not like you're so focused on, oh, there was this bad thing and this bad thing happened. But it's like, yeah, but what difference would it have made if they did the thing you said? You know what I mean? You now sometimes I think that there are certain there are certain events that are so bad or so I can't get over, as Mandel would say, that that it, they even if they don't have the strongest of causation connections, they can still you can still carry the day on causation because they're so wacky. You know right. what I mean? Or they're so different than the way people view the world that they just they can't get over it. They can't stop thinking about it. And they think it must have somehow had an effect on this. And and just so everyone who's listening who's not a geek like you and I are, Mark Mandel has written two books for AAJ Press. Uh, framing the case and then advance framing the case, which are, are brilliant cases that They're everybody so, it should everybody should be reading. Quite so frankly, good. along with the rules of the road, or along with reptile, along with Keith Mitnick's book, um, yeah, and, a, I, and along Dave, and along with David Ball on damages, well, I think are the big it, ones I read uh, once a, a year. All those 100%, books, hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you know, as a as a fellow geek, so I'll, I think one of the things that's so important, at least for me, is um, it's like you have to find all of these different gems from all these amazing lawyers out there that connect with you and not right. everything that say, you know, reptile or trial by human in Rowley or Mitnick is, is going to connect with me. Okay. Um, uh, in, in that it, I would feel comfortable doing it. I'll give you a perfect example. So even though I love it, I love Mitnick's reasonable doubt is not an out. Yes. I, I said it one time in a case and I immediately realized that's just not me. It's just that I think Keith and a lot of other people, it, they're like, it, it works for them. They feel it. It makes sense to them. To me, it, it, I realized that part's not for me. But on the other hand, his putting things in context, I think is one of the greatest ways to undermine an opening statements that I've ever read. And I use that in every trial. You know, and, and same thing, I continue to mostly use the ball and, uh, and Keenan, you know, general outline for most of my opening statements. Uh, I've looked at or considered using other versions and then I, when I saw the lawyer do it, I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. I'll give you an example of that. On Courtroom Viewing Network, uh, Joe Fried's partner, Michael Goldberg, who's phenomenal. A great lawyer. Phenomenal. Michael, yes. And I, I, watch his, I watch his trials over and over again. And he does an opening where the first thing he says to the jury is basically, uh, I'm gonna, you know, promising him that he's gonna make the case as short and sweet as possible. You know, your time's important and I'm gonna, you know, I'm only gonna call certain witnesses because that's all you need to make your decision. And then he goes into talking generally about the plaintiff. And, and there's a reason why he does it. And then he goes into the explanation of the case and then he goes into closing. And I was considering doing that or thinking about doing that didn't resonate with me. When I started thinking about it, I was like, I'm not comfortable doing this. Works tremendously for Joe Freed and, and for Michael Goldberg, but not me. So getting back to your trial, we, yeah. we got a flavor for it. What were you worried about beforehand of what type of jury you would get? So we did a, uh, an empirical study did tons of focus groups ahead of time to understand the best way to present, you know, our theories. And then we confirmed it through using uh, um, uh, this uh, company called Empirical Jury run by a guy named John Campbell. They were great to work with. Uh, but as is relevant to the question you asked, they came back with sort of an idea of our ideal and not ideal jurors. And generally speaking, our more favorable jurors were older in age. And there was a big concern because of the pandemic that we would lose out on a lot of the older demographic because they would have more reasons not to come to court, you know, health wise, or maybe they're caring for a spouse or another family member uh, and couldn't, you know, or they have health conditions, whatever it is. Um, fortunately, that did not come to be. And our, our veneer was all over. And I would say the average age of our jury was probably 50s, 
okay? Wow. With, with some people in their 60s and 70s in there. Now, how did the county you were in fill that veneer, bring people in? Were there certain things they did that they normally don't do? Yeah, and I, again, I, I can't give enough credit to the court system. Judge Jackie Atherton Bernard is who presided over it. And she clearly, you know, months before our trial happened, she was somebody that had the sort of can-do mentality. Like, trials are very important, and we are going to find a way to try cases again. Maybe we won't try them at the same volume, but we are going to find a way to try cases. And That's so great. She and her staff at the Blair County Courthouse did so many great things, I think, to allow that to happen. They could have just thrown their hands up and continued everything and say, well, let's hope for you know, something to improve in 2021. No. Uh, so that was just critical, having a, a judge you know, with that mindset uh, to, to preside over everything, to, to set the right tone. But what they did, uh, now, this wasn't pandemic specific. They were doing this in Blair, but I think it's a great idea in general. Remember the questionnaires I told you that my yeah. associate one. So a month or so before the trial, those people that have been tagged for uh, coming in for jury service, they get a questionnaire. And it's just basic demographic information, but there's a hardship question in it. And it was not tailored to COVID or pandemic issues. However, it was the question that revealed lots of people that were going to have very clear COVID-related reasons that they, they could not come in. And so the court combed them all out ahead of time, told them, hey, look, we're going to continue your um, uh, jury service until some other time in the future. Don't come in. So now what happened was then our whole veneer was full of people that had not indicated any specific uh, COVID-related problem. Now, there was a handful of uh, COVID-related, collaterally related hardships in the veneer that we picked from, but they were specifically to the effect of, you know, my spouse lost their job or got laid off. Got I'm it. the only income, and if I'm here, we're not going to have any money. It was things like that, but there was only maybe, I mean, they wound up bringing like 95 people in for us to select from, and uh, there was only, I would say, maybe six people that got out for, you know, legitimate hardships that were collaterally related to the pandemic. And then otherwise, people were more than happy to serve. And that may have been a product of a rural county, you know, maybe a different mindset than what you might find in more, you know, some more urban sure. uh, type settings, potentially. But that's how it shook out. In so, so you have the veneer and they're sitting, I, I assume, in the courtroom uh, like, like they normally do. Was did you notice any special things done in Blair County to accommodate social distancing, masking, and things of that nature? Oh, yeah. They, <clears throat> the judge, they were adamant about masks. Everybody had to wear a mask, no matter what. And the judge made, an, I thought, an appropriate sort of note about that at the very beginning that, you know, look, everybody, you know, we all have our different belief systems. You know, I have my own personal thoughts about masks, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, that you know, this is a big gathering and we're here for an important purpose and we are going to wear our masks, whatever your belief system is. We appreciate that, we get it. You know, we understand that a lot of you don't want to, but you're going to. And so that was just that and, and there was not one person, I mean, maybe you'd see a nose peek out here and there, but people listen to the judge, they wanna follow the rules That's and they and, and they did what they were told in that way. Now, the other thing, and this is important, I think for a lot of, court systems that are looking to get trials back up if they haven't already. Space is important. You know, you can't probably feasibly try cases right now in small courtrooms. Right. The courtroom that we uh, tried the case in and, and also selected from the jury from is massive. I mean, it's like the inside of like one of those giant churches. And what they did was they brought, the, they brought half the veneer into the courtroom. And they had them all real spaced out, going all the way to the back of the courtroom in the jury box, but everybody was very far apart. Everybody had a numbered paddle. And our voir dire questions were set up that they had to be basically yes or no. So that if somebody had an affirmative response, they'd raise the paddle, then they would collect all those people, they'd bring them over to the side of the courtroom, 
keep them all spread out, and they'd bring them into a separate room outside of the courtroom, one by one, to be individually vaudeered on their responses. Got it. And then they had another group of about 45 people in a different part of the courthouse watching the whole process via video feed, okay, and, and keeping track of their affirmative responses. Because when people in our in-court veneer were excused for one reason or another, cause or hardship, uh, they would fill the spot immediately with somebody from the other room. Then they would ask them, did you answer affirmatively to any of the questions you've heard so far? If they did, bring them in, voir dire them. So they would, they would fill the veneer, not just the jury box. They would actually fill the veneer. Wow. They'd fill it up. Yep. And uh, then ultimately, once we got through all the questions and we still had a full veneer within the courtroom, we you know, did our strikes uh, for peremptories back and forth and, um, and, and had a jury you know, despite all that, it sounds like, oh, that probably took a long time. And, and it was a medical malpractice case, which are notoriously, in my experience, longer to pick. Yes. Uh, we started at nine and we had a jury pick by 1 p.m. Did it feel any different than the normal jury you would pick? No, I really didn't. Interesting. I, you know, we, we had an idea that we wanted, um, you know, if, if possible, uh, female over male, older versus younger, uh, more left-leaning than right-leaning, um, you know, and, and we did our best with that. I still think the majority of our, uh, of our panel, of our jury was probably right-leaning. Um, you know, I think everybody's, got, I think everybody's jury is, is yeah, is but that. we got, um, I, originally, uh, 10 of our 12 jurors were female to start which is wow. what we wanted. So I was really, really happy with And that was panel. based on your focus groups and the empirical jury company, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was actually going to ask you this earlier, Saul, you know, so since you tried so many cases in a jurisdiction where there wasn't that big elaborate, you know, voir right. dire that you could do, did you have kind of a, a default type juror that not knowing anything else about them that you would typically, if you had your choice, put on the jury? Yes. Uh, I did. I also like people who are over 50. I thought they, they would understand the value of money and understand responsibility a lot better. Mm -hmm. I, I always like to have at least, we only had eight jurors or six. Uh, I always like to have two or three women. Yeah. Because I just thought women just have a different way of, of seeing the world. Yeah. And, and they can, you know, whereas especially white men, we are, whether, and I'm not being political or not, but we have a certain privilege that, that others just don't have. Yeah. It just, it's just the nature of the beast. And they, and they tend to look at things a different way, more black and white. Or I think women tend to understand when somebody does something that may not be the smartest, but why they would do it and they would be more forgiving, has been my experience. So my, my prototypical juror, even if I can't talk to them, is 30 to 50-year-old woman. Yeah, That's my idea. That. And, and my, my, I think the point you just made is a really, really good one. I had not thought about, about the different view of the world because of the, you know, the, the male privilege, you know, or that, that, that aspect of it. Uh, I think that's fascinating. I'm going to think more about that. Um, but personally for me, I basically grew up in a household of women. You know, I was basically raised by my mom and I have three sisters. <laughs> so I just naturally am more comfortable, I think, you know, communicating with women than, you know, men. And Interesting. I have two daughters and one sister. Okay. So yeah. Maybe that's why. I, I even I, think about that. That's, so, that's interesting. Uh, so, so despite my, my trial uh, hot streak, you know, over the last like seven years or so, my partner and I tried a, a med mal two and a half years ago now uh, that we lost and uh, should have won. I feel we got robbed, but you know, you, we, it was like that thing where you're, you're picking the jury and I just, I, like, just the pan was start. I was like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not feeling this group. And I couldn't quite figure out why. And then you're making your selections and, oh, this person said that, da, 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 da. Then, the, you know, then they seat them at the end. And it's like, and I was like, oh, man, this is not good. And it was like 10, like, young guys. <laughs> I was like, how did this happen? And uh, I just never felt a connection with them during the trial and uh yeah you know it just and i feel like all my other ones all my other good verdicts i've i've had a couple male four persons but mostly i, I usually wind up having when i've won 
uh, female, uh, you know, for foreman. So it's funny because the one thing that I've seen, and we've done probably uh, last year two hundred focus groups. This year, a lot less. Yeah, is the the young male the millennial male, I don't like to use that word just because people get so offended by it, but the young male really are not good. They're tough. They're, They're really, really they just don't understand responsibility. They don't understand the value of money. They don't, they, they can't fathom living 50 more years. And when you're using that as a damages model, they just can't, they, they just, they can't fathom it. That's been right. my experience. Yeah, I agree. Um, so getting back, I'm, I'm curious, getting back to the trial. So now you've got the jury picked. What protocols did the court put in place for the pandemic while you were trying the case? Okay, so a couple of cool things. Um, so the big courtroom, so the jury, so the way the, the, the room was set up where you'd actually, the area to try the case is, imagine a square, okay? And on one side, the judge, you know, and, and the witness box facing in. Facing them on the other side of the square was the jury box. And then on the other two sides was counsel facing each other, if you can imagine that kind of scenario. Oh, wow. Right? It's so, like a wrestling match. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so the jury was all spread out, not in the jury box. Uh, so they were some in the jury box, but then in chairs off to the sides of it. And then the judge realizing that she needed to have depth of jurors, she had them, she had the courthouse build a riser. And so there was sort of a platform attached to the back of the jury box that went back that there was jurors out there so that they were higher and could see everything, but, but still be further back and distanced out. Okay. So count. So then other sort of unique aspects of this is uh, council was not allowed to get up from council table during questioning. We were allowed during opening and closing to stand at a central podium that had a microphone at it. You had to be in front of a microphone or else nobody could hear you. So in opening, I would stand at the central podium with the mic, but otherwise, whenever Greg and I would question, we had to be at council table at the mic. And then the jury, or excuse me, the witness box was encased in, you know, PVC or whatever the plastic right. they're using. Same with the judge, very separated apart. And the witnesses were encouraged, but not required to take their masks off for testimony. And the reason was, was that uh, Judge Bernard sort of as a bellwether to our trial, tried a small uh, criminal case a week and a half before ours and found that the jurors were requesting whether the witness could take their mask off. Because at that one, they were trying to have everybody just do it with the mask on. Jurors were specifically doing that. And so in our case, um, all but one witness uh, removed their mask. And the reason the one did it, it was a defense witness who was uh, some kind of critical care pulmonologist. I don't even know why he was there, quite frankly. <laughs> and, and he came in with like the craziest looking N95 mask I've ever seen. You could barely hear him through it. And then he proceeds to tell the jury that he's doing that because all he does all day long is intubate COVID patients. And um, I was like, you know, that's obviously tremendously commendable. I don't know how thrilled the jury is to now know that necessarily, but, right. you know. But Did you find the, the defense? So, so well, let me get back to that. When you ask questions, did you have your mask on or off? Oh, oh, I didn't mention that. Counsel mask all the time. Non-stop. Even when asking questions. No matter what. So now you, you, you have this, this new way of trying a case. How did you feel it affected your ability to connect with either a witness or a jury? Juror? Zero. Really? So I was concerned about, oh, you know, what it's going to be like wearing a mask sure. the whole time. That's what all we're all concerned time. about. So I keep likening it to you tried cases in front of judges that you never tried before. You've tried cases in a courtroom you've never tried before. And every one of them has their unique layout in the courtroom where the judge has their own idiosyncratic rules that you have to follow. Sometimes in federal court, you always had to be at a podium or at a microphone or whatever. And you adapt and, and you follow the rules and you just do it. And then once the judge says, you know, are you ready to call your first witness? Are you ready to open? You do not think about any of that stuff. So Greg and I, we were completely oblivious to the fact that we were wearing a mask. It didn't affect the way that our voice quality came out to the microphone. People could hear us just fine. 
and we were not thinking about it at all during the day, we would get back to our hotel room uh, or a hotel and realize we still had our masks on. You know what I mean? Because they just are used to it. So now, really, now, did you use a regular mask or one of those masks that are plastic too, where you can see your face? So I personally find those repulsive. <laughs> <laughs> and my my partner Greg said, "Should we do the clear mask thing?" But every time I see those, the people, it's like all this condensate and it's like dripping oh, yeah. down. Yeah. I was like, I said, I will prohibit you from doing <laughs> that. Nobody on our side is going to be wearing a clear mask. So Greg thought about it, but I don't know. I'm, a, I'm kind of a psycho about certain things. I was like, there's no way we're wearing. So I wore like a camo type mask. Right. I'm not really a camo hunter guy, but I thought it kind of looked cool. And Greg wore sort of a black one. Um, How about the defense? Did they, did they do the same thing or did they? They had to. I mean, the judge required us to wear masks nonstop. So defense counsel, he wore a medical mask. Um, I thought that. I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I think these are such small issues in the scheme of things, but right. you still wonder sort of like what impression does it give off? I thought the medical mask doesn't, I don't know. I don't think it comes off as well as just like a nice, you know, triple layered cotton right. mask kind of thing. Uh, here's the, uh, these are all the questions I've been waiting to ask you. Yeah. I should have just called you actually. Um, the other question I have is, you know, our facial expressions sometimes are so important at trial. Did you alter the way your body language was because you couldn't move around and, and your face was, was not exposed? Couldn't do it. Um, so I generally, I, I emote a lot. I, you know, I make faces. I'm not even realized that I'm making faces. Of course. And, yeah. You know, for good or bad, that's just the way that I communicate with people. And so, you know, maybe that had some degree of impact in the way that I would address the jury when in opening and closing. But in our exams, it was impossible to even look because the, you know, I would be to the left at a microphone looking at the, the juror, or excuse me, the witness over here. And the jury at that point now, with me having to turn to the witness, they're almost behind me. Right. And, and you're not allowed to get up from counsel table to question. So it's not like those crosses where sometimes you're almost like talking to the jury while you're crossing somebody. Oh, I did that all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. so you couldn't. That was not even in the cards for anybody. Um, now, as far as how it comes off in opening and closing, I don't know. I just, uh, to me, I, I still feel it was a non-issue. I don't think it impacted anything. I mean, they could see my eyes. You know, I could connect with them. They're in the mask. I'm in the mask. You know, can I see them, you know, smiling or not or whatever? Uh, you know, I still probably have some sense of it. And I felt very connected to the jury in this case, you know, speaking That's... with them. I felt we were on the same page despite the masks. And I just... You know, and maybe there's something to the fact of, you know, that sort of, I don't know. I mean, it's not necessarily tribe, but there's like, we're kind of all in the same boat together. Right. You know? We're all doing the masks. Last pandemic question. Did you alter the way you tried the case? In other words, either the way you were framing it or how many witnesses you called because of the pandemic? So, I mean, we were very, very cognizant of trying to streamline our case to be as uh, short, sweet, and concise as possible. I have been doing that for a while now, um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, that Don Keenan wrote a great blog about the benefits of trying a quick case a long time ago that has a lot of really good ideas. And now uh, Joe Freed um, has talked a lot about his speed trial method. Yes. I was sort of naturally doing that already. And my thinking for why I try really quick cases is I do, like you, focus groups a lot. And I find that when I do a, you know, basically a narrative of the case, okay, so I just give them an overall view, not leaning one way or the other. The jury gets the majority of the big picture issues. You know, you may be able to reframe things and resequence it to, you know, impact the way that they process the information and, and persuade that way. But I find that jurors get it in focus groups so quickly. They can get it after a half an hour or 45 minutes. Why do I need to take a week to tell them the same basic set of facts? You know, I, I have this argument with my clients all the time, uh, are, you know, discussion where, where I, you know, I have some really great trial lawyers who bring me in to help them. 
and they have a certain way of doing it. And their way is to tell everything they know. And we go back and forth. I said, well, every sentence you have, you make, every fact you give should be advancing your story. 100%. Yeah, the, the, it may be a fact, but who cares about it if it doesn't advance your story? It's such a huge point, such a huge, and that, I mean, it's, that's continuing to dawn on me, like today, even as we're talking, but, you know, again, we were talking about uh, Mark Mandel's uh, interview on Mike Callen's show, and, and he just stresses that. I mean, that's what that framing is. He's like, at the, at the essence, at the core is, you need to focus and frame your case around your best evidence. There's no question. And, and, and all this other extraneous stuff, you're more than likely just causing yourself problems as the plaintiff. Listen, in, in a med mal case or a nursing home case, you are trying a different case than the defense, right? 100%. You, you are, I am trying a case about all the bad things that the defendant did and the fact that they just obliterated my client's safety and the rules for that. The defense only wants to talk about the fact that my client had a cold when she was 16 and uh, obviously she saw a psychiatrist. We can't get the records, but that has something to do with the reason she died and, and just making, just throwing everything at the wall. I, mean, I, I guess it's the same everywhere in it these is. cases. hundred uh, percent. So if we're going to focus on three things and the jury leaves with those three things, and if we do it right, they're going to find it in our favor. Yeah. I mean, you're certainly improving your chances then if you go the kitchen sink route and, you know, but what about this? And you, you know, this issue spotting approach to trying your case that I think is just more either lack of preparation or lack of confidence in your core theory of the case. Um, so to get back to your question, and we really focused even more than ever on making it a streamlined. So we incorporated a lot more video than normal. So I personally- What do you mean by that? So the uh, use, use of trial. Right, you know, uh, testimony done ahead of time. Got it. So, you know, I think the the sort of default for most lawyers is you know, trial video, you know, uh, pre-recorded witnesses is, is way worse than having people in live. I a thousand percent disagree, uh, especially now with the way that our behavior has changed during the pandemic and we've become so much more screen dependent and screen sure. accustomed. People are used to watching things and watching people and listening to people on screens, much more so than they ever were before, but they were a lot already. So anyway, we had, um, I don't know, probably five different witnesses out of 16 in our case in chief that we recorded ahead of time. We did our life care planner, we did our economist, we did two lay witness, three lay witnesses, and, um, and one medical witness all on video and it was an, an economist on video yeah it was fine how long how long was your direct uh of the economist yeah that was actually kind of annoyingly one of our longer exams <laughs> i was just like I, I couldn't i just i couldn't find a way i don't know why and i i need to go back and analyze that but the the total exam with cross of the economist was 52 minutes okay I mean, still longer than I wanted. Absolutely. But we, everybody else was very, very fast. And, you know, to our credit with The Economist, we're constantly pulling things up on the screen. So it's not just right. his head on there. Uh, plus, you know, we edited the video after the fact to cut out dead time and cut out the read on and try to make it as punchy as possible. But I'll tell you a couple of things I thought were pretty cool. We did Zoom video use depositions. And they were not with the classic boring gray background, okay? They were like in people's homes. Like we had this really impactful testimony by our, our client's employer, his boss at the time. And it was so poignant. And, but he was doing it from his office at the, you know, at the company that the guy Interesting. worked Interesting. You know, so it was like, you're there. It's like real. It's, it was like, the, oh, this guy, it's, you're, this, we're talking to his boss in his boss's office. And then his caretaker because okay, he has to have a caretaker to watch out for him because he's kind of a danger to himself because his brain injury has a really uh, you know, bad short-term memory. His caretaker, we got in between, he finished his shift with our client and then was, had an hour to go get to his next client. And he shot the video that we used at trial on his phone, on Zoom, in his car. 
And at first wow. I was like, oh, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> it was awesome. It was like, it changed things up. It was raw. It was like, this is what this guy does. He sees him. We're in his car. Now he's going over here to see this other. It was, there's you something. Think the fact that you put those witnesses in front of the jury in their own world gave them more credibility. I don't. Yes. The answer is absolutely yes. And that was not intentional. That was just the way things worked out. But in hindsight, I loved it. I thought it was a hundred times better than boring, gray, you know, pop sure. art screen background. 10 times better. Than that. Well, we've gone so long. I may even break this into two podcasts. Yeah, whatever uh, you want to do. You yeah. know, I can talk all day with you, man. Uh, Brendan Lupitin, what a great podcast. You, you are so much fun to listen to and such a breath of fresh air. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, man. No, I love it. Thank you for letting me, uh, you know, hang with you and, and talk shop. Can you tell everybody who's listening how they can get the best way to get a hold of you if they need you? Yeah. So uh, my law firm is Myers, Evans, Lupitin, and Uniton. Our website is Myers MedMau. And uh, these days, as you were kind enough to uh, start the um, uh, podcast with, I'm really trying to put out a lot of videos about trial strategy on my YouTube channel. Uh, and that's just uh, Brendan Lupitin. If you look on uh, YouTube and just look my name up, L-U-P-E-T-I-N, uh, I have a lot of entertaining videos about the psychology of trying cases. I'm uh, putting up, so I shot a bunch of diary videos in lead up to this trial. Uh, I this, saw that. And I I'm saw gonna that. I'm going to have more and more to give you the sense of the thinking of somebody going into a trial and they don't know what's going to happen in this thing to just remember where my mindset was and mind frame was. Um, and, uh, and other material like that. So those are great places to check me out. And, and again, Saul, thank you so much. Thank this you, Brandon. Awesome. This was great. Really appreciate you coming by with us. You're the man. And thank you again, Brandon. Uh, that was just uh, really informative about how the pandemic did, or in this case, maybe had no impact on uh, a medical malpractice trial in Pennsylvania. Uh, again, thank you to Brendan Lupitin from Pittsburgh, PA, uh, and giving us a lot of uh, detail about what the court did and how they selected a jury in this new pandemic era. Uh, Brendan gave us a lot of really good information about what to do and what not to do uh, in order to change the way you try the case uh, to a jury while being in a mask and behind uh, blue site PVC. Um, a lot of information there and a lot of food for thought. Uh, remember it, just because it happened to Brendan doesn't mean the same thing is going to happen to you, but let's not panic and let's not say we're not trying cases. Let's move forward. Let's adapt. That's what we do as trial lawyers. Now it's uh, time to spend a moment uh, in our nursing home minute. As I've discussed on this podcast, Gruber Trial Consulting helps lawyers all over the country handle their nursing home cases. And in a case we're handling now, or at least consulting on now, uh, a huge um, witness is coming up as a, as a CNA or aide. And uh, I've had a lot of discussion with the lawyer about to depose this aide about how to do so. And one of the things we discussed is how you need to um, empower the aide and really connect with the aide. Because more often than not, the CNAs, the aides, they are on the forefront of all care. And their work is God's work. It is some of the most difficult things you could possibly do. Most, more often than not, they love their residents and they want to tell you the truth. You have to give them the opportunity to tell you the truth and create a safe haven for them to tell you the truth. That is the most important thing to do with the aid. You're not bullying the aid. You're not cross-examining the aid. You're, you're looking at the aid and saying, tell me how it feels. How does it make you feel? What did you feel when you couldn't get to the resident in time? Things like that. You need to make the aid your, one of your heroes in your case. And in some instances, maybe even a victim as well. Certainly not a bad person, unless it's just one of those cases. Um, finally, we try to give quotes, stories, music, uh, lyrics to help trial lawyers try their cases. And in, in reading some things and with some of the craziness that's going on in today's country, I came across a quote that I hadn't heard before by Oscar Wilde, but it's a great quote. It may not apply to trying cases, but boy, if we all followed this quote, 
it probably would help America and the world. Selfishness, selfishness is not living as one wishes to live. It is asking others to live as one wishes to live. Think about that. Again, this is Saul Gruber from Gruber Trial Consulting, your host of The Jury Thinks What? a podcast by trial lawyers for trial lawyers on the Lawyer Minds uh, webcast. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time. That concludes another episode of the Jury Thinks What podcast, part of the Lawyer Minds ecosystem. Thank you for listening, and we truly hope it was worth your time. Please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Explore the other content that Lawyer Minds has to offer and engage with us on social media. Your feedback and ideas are always welcomed. See you next time.